welcome everyone. I'm uh, Mariana Martins. This is my uh, sign name. This. Uh, thank you to the Brazilian Linguistics Association, Abralin, for organizing this uh, virtual event, Abralin ao Vivo, and keeping all of us linguists from all over the world in such a close online contact during the pandemic. This free accessible series of lectures is possible, of course, due to the cooperation with a worldwide set of linguistic institutions, such as uh, Comité International Permanent, Permanent de, de Linguiste, Association Internationale de Linguistique Appliquée, Association de Linguística y Filología de América Latina, Sociedad Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, Sociedad Española de Linguística, Linguistic Society of America, Australian Linguistic Society, Linguistics Association of Great Britain, British Association for Applied Linguistics, and uh, Societas Linguistica Europea. I am very happy to be here, not only because Brazil is uh, very special to me, but also because I am to introduce a person that is very, very dear to me, my PhD supervisor, Victoria Nist. My first contact with Victoria goes back to 2007 when I started working together with uh, Marta Morgado with the new deaf community of Guinea-Bissau. By that time, Victoria had already built a unique network for African deaf studies. She was and still is a beacon for whoever does research in African sign languages. Victoria is an associate professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands, specialized in African sign languages. She has been leading projects on documentation and description of African sign languages in urban and village settings with four published video corpora. Her project focuses also on communication of deaf parents on gestures and specifically on size and shape, shape depictions in countries such as Mali, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya and others. Together with Shane uh, Gilchrist, they started the first workshop on African Sign Languages at the World Congress of African Linguistics in 2009. And also in her current project, From Gesture to Lang Language, Victoria and her team organized in Ghana, the very first African summer school for deaf academics involving 11 African countries. Apart all this expertise, I am extremely proud and honored to work with a person that is always looking to empower the deaf. I will now give the screen to Victoria, Victoria Nist, this, this is her sign name, uh, to talk about documenting and describing gestural environments of sign languages. And please feel free to pose your questions in the chat during the presentation. The screen is yours, Victoria, success. Wow. Thank you very much, Mariana, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And of course, a big thank you to the organizers of Abralin. I feel very honored to be here and excited uh, to be able to talk about um, the topic that uh, I'm really fascinated by at the moment, which, is, which are the quotable gestures and the relation or the impact they have on um, the structure of sign languages. Um, I will also uh, share my screen, of course. Um, and let me set that up. Here we are. Um, right. So uh, I will talk about uh, why I think that we need a systematic documentation of quotable gestures and their aerial distribution and why that is indispensable for a good understanding of uh, sign language typology. Um, the talk will have basically two parts. The first part, I'll try to show why I think this is so important. Um, and in the second part, the at least as important question of how can we do that? What kind of methodologies can we use for that? Um, well, in recent years, of course, we've seen more and more studies on um, uh, the kind of parallel parallels between gesture and sign language structures. And it's the general assumption that sign languages during their emergence or even after that uh, absorb or integrate structures from uh, the 
hearing, non-signing, gestural environment uh, and turn them into linguistic elements. Uh, from the early days of sign language research, uh, people have observed how quotable gestures, so gestures with a fixed form and a fixed meaning, like for example, the thumbs up uh, gesture for okay or good, uh, have become incorporated into the lexicons of sign language. And sometimes even uh, grammaticalizing into function signs. Um, an example, uh, or actually many examples of such integrated quotable gestures uh, are found in the etymological dictionary of uh, French sign language published by De La Porte uh, in 2007. And I'll give you a second to look at the slide. And actually, this example that you see here uh, is about the sign, uh, one of the signs for nothing in French sign language. And uh, it moves uh, from the, the thumb from below the chin as depicted in picture four. So nothing. And um, uh, De La Porte says, well, this, this sign is actually based on, uh, on gestures by, used by the hearing community uh, as depicted in picture one and two. The, the gesture in picture one is, is a very well-known gesture, I think, to in, at least in Southern Europe. Uh, it's also called the sobriquet gesture and it flicks the fingers from beneath the chin forward. Uh, the second gesture is um, uh, the gesture that flicks the thumbnail, the nail of the thumb from behind the teeth. And De La Porte says that uh, these two gestures actually merged and became the basis for um, uh, this current present day uh, LSF sign for nothing, but also for uh, a children's gesture a kind of mocking gesture um, that you see in picture three. Um, the sign nothing has also um, further grammaticalized into a negative suffix um, and found as found in, for example, combinations of sleep with the negative su suffix meaning insomnia or um, children followed by the negative suffix meaning infertile um, and of course, there are many more examples like this in the dictionary, but this raises uh, perhaps the question with you. Uh, okay, so that's interesting for etymology, but how is it also relevant for um, sign language typology, for example? Um, to uh, answer this question, I need you to, to I need to take you uh, to a little diversion and um, to look not at quotable gestures, but at illustrative gestures. And I'll give you a second to look at the slide. So on the slide on the right hand, you see uh, the map of West Africa. And um, in the square boxes, you see uh, sign language names, Malian sign language, uh, the sign language of Adam Robert. Uh, and this is the sign for Adam Robert. So it's the index fingers uh, tapping a, a drum. Uh, and there is also the sign language of Bwakako in Côte d'Ivoire. In Adam Robert sign language, um, I found uh, about 13 years ago that this sign language is a bit, is, differs from sign language of the Netherlands, my home country, in the sense that uh, it has a different type of size and shape specifier signs. So it uses uh, body-based size and shape specifier signs. Uh, so body parts are used to show the size of reference as depicted an example in picture one. It also uses space-based size and shape specifier signs as depicted in picture two. So that's um, the space-based size uh, and shape specifier signs are also found in sign language of the Netherlands, but not the body-based uh, ones. Interestingly, when uh, I expanded my studies to other West African sign languages, I found that they too use the body-based 
size and shape specify assignments. And this uh, triggered me to study the, the gestures, the illustrative spontaneous gestures of hearing non-signers of the spoken languages surrounding these sign languages to see if uh, such a difference uh, was found in the gesturing as well. And indeed, that was exactly what we found. So um, this suggests that um, the cross-linguistic variation or aerial variation in uh, illustrative gestures may lead to uh, cross-linguistic variation in depictive constructions in sign languages, at least when it comes to size and shape specifiers. Um, of course, this raises the question, to what extent uh, quotable gestures like illustrative gestures may influence the uh, structure or lexicons of sign languages as well. Um, I think it does. And I will present three cases to help us uh, reflect about how this may be the case. The first case is the sign uh, refuse. And uh, again, I will give you a second to look at the slide. So down left, we see uh, four pictures of uh, different sign languages, and um, but all are basically uh, the sign variants of the sign for refuse. So uh, the elbows clap to the sides, um, it may be one elbow or it may be two elbows. And this sign for refuse is found in, um, set in, in uh, many different uh, African, West African sign languages. On the map, uh, I have indicated um, five sign languages where these, uh, this refuse gesture is used. Um, so this uh, suggests that uh, either these sign languages must be related, uh, which is very unlikely because we find in these uh, five sign languages shown on the map, we find village sign languages that are hundreds of kilometers apart from each other um, and where it's very unlikely to come up with a scenario in which they have had uh, either contact in uh, historical contact or even where, where they would have descended from a, from a common ancestor language. Um, and indeed, later on in this presentation, uh, we will show that indeed this came from, uh, there is a parallel uh, quotable gesture in uh, many countries in West Africa. Okay. Case two um, are the uh, gender classifier handshapes that we find in the Japanese sign language family. So uh, this family is actually the only family, as far as we know, uh, in the world that uses gendered classifier handshakes. So uh, whereby an extended pinky refers to uh, a male, a female uh, referent and an upright um, thumb to a male referent. And um, we see that this is a productive or uh, productive morpheme in Japanese sign language, Korean sign language, and Taiwanese sign language. And um, in Japanese uh, culture, the extended index, uh, sorry, the extended pinky finger is a, a common quotable gesture to me, meaning girlfriend, uh, as indicated on uh, the picture on the slide. Um, how did it end up in uh, Korea and Taiwan, where we don't see, where it seems that this is not a common uh, gesture used by the hearing, wider hearing culture? Um, here we see that uh, the gendered classifiers were actually introduced um, with Japanese sign language during the occupation by Japan of these two countries in the first half of the 20th century. So um, basically we see two very distinct patterns 
uh, that uh, are behind uh, the distribution of uh, signs based on quotable gestures. So in the kind of West African scenario on uh, under A, in the A scenario, um, we see that refuse uh, was independently uh, absorbed, absorbed in unrelated sign languages due to uh, a similar quotable gesture existing in the wider hearing uh, gesture culture. In scenario B, we see a very different distribution whereby a gesture is absor uh, absorbed once. So there's one single innovation event and then the gesture is carried on and spread uh, as part of this sign language structure to other areas. Uh, so there we see that it's kind of a transmission uh, through uh, related languages. Um, and obviously this has important implications for our understanding of um, sign language families or phylogenetics. Um, and through that also on uh, sign language typology, because when we uh, do typological studies, we want to sample, uh, we, we try to balance out that we uh, have a neat and balanced sample of um, languages from different families. And uh, of course, for that purpose, we need to know um, which, uh, well, first of all, which uh, families sign languages belong, but also uh, we need to take into account um, the phenomena that may inf influence um, similarities between sign languages. So like in spoken languages, um, sign language families um, are studied and proposed um, based on, well, historical uh, information, but also on lexical lists. So concepts lists are compared to see if there are any cognates, corresponding cognates across those languages. And in sign language lists, we uh, have to correct for iconicity because if we do not correct for iconicity, we will find that many sign languages um, seem to be related because, uh, for example, so many sign languages have a sign for eat that is located around the mouth. So we need to uh, correct for um, iconicity, but it seems we need to correct, we might need to correct for quotable gesture environment as well, because that seems to introduce uh, a bias uh, as well. Okay. To illustrate that, I would like to go to case three, and I will give you a second again to have a look at the slide. The slide actually represents um, instances of um, the sign uh, nothing that we saw in French sign language previously. Um, so uh, the homophonous um, or formally, formationally similar uh, signs are found in uh, various European sign languages. Um, as you can see, uh, Irish sign language has a virtually identical sign meaning nothing um, and ASL uh, has slightly altered the meaning and perhaps function uh, of uh, the nothing sign and it has become uh, a more general negative marker. In the other European sign languages, we see negative meanings as well, but uh, sometimes um, related to failure uh, in Dutch sign language and Portuguese sign language sometimes to damage um, and sometimes uh, a more kind of mocking or mischievous meaning like in British sign language where we see tough luck um, and the literal meaning of mischief in Dutch sign language and Swedish sign language. So we see related meanings, um, most of them negative, negatively inspired and uh, we may wonder why is this? Is this merely a coincidence or, uh, or not? And um, to what extent do we see a pattern 
that resembles, say, the, the transmission pattern that we saw for um, the Jap Japanese sign language family, right? Where we see that uh, there is basically a uh, transmission of a signed form. And that is, for example, what seems to be the case for uh, ASL and Irish sign language, which are both known to be related to French sign language. Um, but it is less clear how this would work out, for example, for British sign language, of which we know that it is claimed not to be related to French sign language. Of course, this could be a borrowing, but it could also be that there is a gestural substrate to it. Now, um, I have been bothering a lot of people <laughs> in the, the past weeks, sorry for that, uh, asking them if they knew a gesture like this in the hearing uh, culture or the hearing environment. And uh, I also went through, uh, looked for, scrutinized a lot of uh, books that uh, claim to be gesture dictionaries and, and studies on gestures. And I did come across a number of um, gestures that seem to be uh, at the source of uh, these signs. So one of the examples uh, I got is from a, from a colleague from Italy, and she showed there is actually three variants of the sobriquet gesture with three different hand shapes, one of them uh, with an extended thumb, as you see in the pictures below on the right hand. Um, of course, we cannot answer the question about uh, how we can explain the, the similarities in uh, the nothing sign uh, in the European sign languages without having a proper understanding of uh, gestures and the spread of these gestures uh, in, we in Western Europe. So that's why I would say that, we, uh, that a systematic documentation of quotable gestures and their aerial distribution is uh, indispensable for a proper understanding of sign language typology. So that's basically part one. Um, part two is actually the harder part because that raises the question of how can we do that? And um, if there is one thing that I learned from uh, gesture research over the past years, is that it's actually much harder to grasp uh, a gesture than a sign, because gestures are much more um, elusive and, uh, well, <laughs> maybe much more gas-like than signs, which are much more concrete. And indeed, if we look at um, studies attempting to to uh, document uh, gestures, gesture repertoires of individual countries or individual groups, we already see quite a lot of struggles to uh, document purely uh, the gesture uh, repertoire for, for, for that single group or that single country. Um, well, sorry, there's a lot of text on the slide. Maybe I'll try to summarize it by saying that uh, we, uh, things that we need to take into account is, for example, iconicity. Um, when uh, do people recognize the meaning of a gesture because of iconicity? And when do people recognize it because of conventionalization? Um, what is the role of context and facial expressions? Um, how, so one of the studies blocked actually the access to the facial expression uh, and, and tested to what extent um, quotable gestures are, are still recognizable. Um, also, how do you take into account or how do you go about the fact that gestures often have a range of related and interlocking meanings um, with interpersonal variation in their use and, inter, uh, and context dependent variation? Um, interestingly, indeed, although uh, this notion of shared uh, lexicon due to shared uh, quotable gestures in unrelated or related sign languages has been observed in other parts of the world as well. For example, in, in the Yucatec Maya gesture uh, sign language in uh, Mexico, 
um, it is striking to see that we actually have almost no studies looking at the aerial distribution of gestures. Um, I only have these two, uh, one on uh, the distribution of oral of an oral gesture, clicks, or uh, for example, confirmation or negation. And that's a study by Jill, G-I-L, 2013. Um, and the only study I'm aware of uh, looking at the distribution of manual quotable gestures is uh, the one um, published by Morris et al. Uh, almost well, 40 years ago and um, well, uh, entitled Gestures, quite appropriately so. And if you know of any uh, other studies that look at the aerial distribution of gestures, I would be mo most grateful if you could let me know. Okay, so what did uh, Morris et al. do? They um, really set up this very impressive uh, project, it seems, where in three years' time, with four co-authors and a whole team of interviewers, they um, visited uh, 40 locations in Europe, mostly Western Europe, because I, I guess because of the Cold War, Eastern Europe is not represented in the book. And they uh, interviewed 30 participants, uh, all men between 20 and 40 years old. And they tried to select people who were, um, who didn't look like very rich people who might have traveled, but more like a local profile. And they showed pictures of uh, 20 gestures, 20 quotable gestures uh, that you can see on the slide here. And uh, for example, slide, uh, the picture uh, 17 is again, the, the one of the nothing gestures that we saw earlier. And they asked, is this gesture used around here? And this allowed them to uh, plot answers by um, distinguishing roughly between, uh, most people said yes, uh, most people said no, or somehow uh, in between that. And um, if you look at the, at the map on the left, you see the distribution of people who uh, responded to the sobriquet gesture and said it was merely a negative gesture. And that is without a kind of dismissive uh, connotation. And as you can see, that is mostly uh, Southern Italy. Um, similarly, uh, the distribution of the, the teeth flick or nothing is represented. And uh, as you can see, that has a distribution that tends more towards France and Spain. Uh, the third example or the third map represents the distribution of uh, the backward head toss uh, for, for negation or for negative. And um, as you can see, that centers around Southern Italy and Greece. And uh, the uh, researchers uh, were intrigued by the fact that the, the boundary of the distribution of this gesture seemed to cut right through um, Italy, basically. And they were uh, so curious to see if they could really establish where the isogloss of this uh, gesture would be because above, um, no, sorry, yes, above the, in Northern Italy, um, it's the, the negative, the negation is expressed by a, a left and right head shake. And in the South, you see the backwards head toss. So um, what they did was uh, zoom in and they uh, asked many more people, so I think 750 respondents in Italy, uh, around Naples um, about uh, their, their gesture, their head gesture for negation. And they found that, uh, they found a very clear isogloss for this uh, gesture. Um, okay, so uh, that sets the, um, the standard high, I would say. Uh, a very impressive study and um, uh, almost intimidating, I would say. 
also in view of the fact that West Africa is like three times bigger than Western Europe uh, with many more uh, different ethnic and linguistic groups um, with hardly uh, any studies on, uh, on gesture use or on, on, on quotable gestures or gestures at all. Um, and also, uh, well, not a, not a huge uh, funding, um, not a huge project with funding for many years to solely focus on quotable gestures. So uh, over the years, over the past years, I've been uh, setting up um, studies on quotable gestures in West Africa or Africa at large, um, using trial and error, going through literature, old sources, travelers, like uh, 18th century travel reports, um, bugging colleagues, bugging friends, observing, um, looking at similarities between sign languages. And um, at one point I realized I needed to set up a more systematic documentation, a da database to keep track of all the responses I would get because it was getting too much. So um, since we have a lot of African language research in Leiden, I uh, decided to kind of set up an opportunistic data collection uh, format. Um, if a speaker of an African language would come to Leiden and would be willing to, uh, yeah, to, to participate in uh, a gesture collection session, um, I would grab that opportunity gladly. And, um, would go through a, a preset menu of tasks to um, look at uh, not only quotable gestures, but also illustrative gestures and other spontaneous gestures. Um, so this involved um, a production task whereby um, I had collected gestures from literature and observation, etc but also from other studies on quotable gestures in other countries. Uh, they would work with the lists of meanings or messages as they're often referred to. Uh, and so I would uh, basically do an interview and go through all the um, messages or meanings to see if um, the respondent had a gesture for that. And it was interesting to see that people generally had quite conscious and well and clear ideas about whether or not a gesture was used. Uh, so that was encouraging. Um, I also included a, an, um, a gesture recognition task with uh, 32 clips and um, uh, asking if the person would recognize the gestures. Uh, initially, we just re we kept the, paper, the responses on paper, but later we filmed it in case people would uh, volunteer uh, interesting alternative signs, uh, gestures, sorry. Um, and uh, well, so far we had uh, 14 West African respondents, also people from other parts of Africa, but in West Africa, uh, we had a number of, well, 14 respondents. And um, we came to, uh, we found that at least, um, for a, a large, well, for some gestures, uh, no, sorry, I should start again. For some, yeah, well, maybe I should start with the gestures, yes. Um, that we find shared gestures in um, many different countries. And I'll, uh, and actually the map is what uh, is showing the distribution. Um, so I will uh, show the gestures, if I may, uh, that are used in this, uh, or that are shown in this um, map. Um, and so uh, you can see the dots, the colored dots, uh, each representing a quotable gesture. So dead, hit, refuse, what, work, and woman, which I will now show in order. And I hope I hope that was clear. 
Um, and as you can see, these uh, gestures are found in uh, quite a lot of different countries. And um, where you see a black uh, circle with white inside, that means that we didn't get a positive response for that country in the gesture, gesture task that we did in Leiden. Um, okay. Here you see the same uh, color coding for the equivalent lexical items in West African sign languages. So um, if we look at uh, this map, we see uh, that uh, quite a number of these gestures that we just saw have equivalent lexical signs in uh, these five sign languages represented here. For example, the, the gesture refuse is found as a lexical item, as I already uh, indicated in the beginning, in uh, these five sign languages. And the same holds for the gesture for work and the gesture for woman. Okay, and interestingly, you can see that the gesture, uh, sorry, the sign, this is always challenging, sorry, the sign for dead, which looks like closing the nose, um, yeah, as if with a key. Uh, it's only found in Guinea Bissau sign language and in Mali sign language, Malian sign language. So it has a lesser distribution, seemingly. Uh, all, all in all, out of the tw 32 gestures or 31 gestures presented uh, in that uh, gestura task, 26 were regularly recognized by uh, six or more resp respondents. Um, okay, so that, that does seem to point at some uh, level of conventionalization, perhaps, or alternatively, it could just be a matter of iconicity, right? Um, perhaps, um, yeah, wiping the sweat from the front um, is, transparent enough for people to understand that that means, means to work. So um, to test what, these, what this consistency actually points at, we need larger numbers of respondents. It's still uh, a question, an open question for me, how many more respondents, but it's clear that we need larger number of respondents. And this day and age, fortunately, we have internet. Uh, so an online survey, of course, would greatly uh, expand our possibilities for collecting a large number of um, responses, but it's not a straightforward task to uh, set this up in a reliable way. So what we did was we, we uh, developed an online gesture survey, a pilot basically, where we reduced the number of uh, gestures from 32 or 31 to 14, and we uh, in doing so, we try to keep those uh, gestures that were more on the arbitrary end than uh, on the iconic end. We also decided to blur the face to uh, avoid the face giving away part of the meaning. And uh, we included, uh, so it was a, we made it a multiple choice task with multiple meanings and people could choose more than one answer and the answers included other, and people could indicate what other meaning they um, thought the gesture should have. Uh, it was translated in French and English, and we um, yeah, put it online. And um, this is what, it, what the, the task looked like, basically. So you can see the various meanings there, and also the alternative option. Um, and the instruction. Well, um, we did find, uh, we, we did get a lot of results and, um, but we also uh, encountered some challenges. 
one of the challenges was that we actually did not get a lot of responses from West African respondents, despite our efforts to uh, ask colleagues and ask our networks. Uh, and we got a lot of um, uh, responses from Europe, basically. And um, we realized that another challenge is so, so that the connectivity was uh, definitely an issue. Um, the um, access to a, a device is an issue. Uh, but there is also the bias in language because the, um, the task was not tra translated into local languages. So there were uh, we, the, the use of this online uh, methodology actually introduced quite some biases. Uh, of course, the advantage was that everybody could see uh, a video. Um, so that is made it quite consistent, the input. Um, and after a lot of extra effort, we uh, ended up with 74 respondents from West Africa, and the, we decided to compare them to the 80 respondents from the Netherlands to see if we could find some patterns there. Um, statistical analysis was another uh, setback, I would say. So the, the, the fact that we had multiple answers and uh, the other option and um, uh, the fact that people could, could opt for multiple answers makes uh, a statistical analysis challenging, but the pre-statistic results, I would say, do suggest that we, uh, that there are uh, significant, well, maybe not significant, but I mean, clear differences in responses. Uh, for example, in the interpretation of refuse, but also uh, in dead and also in woman. Um, give you a second to look at that. So interestingly, the West African respondents um, uh, did pick dead as a potential answer uh, in quite uh, some cases, despite the restricted distribution that we found in the offline task earlier. Uh, the Dutch respondents from the Netherlands um, have quite often opted for secret as an answer. And here we seem to have a case of competing uh, gestural forms. So the, 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 the secret uh, option was actually chosen because of the similarity um, of the gesture, uh, of the dead gesture, which looks like closing the nose with a key. Um, the secret gesture probably refers or, or resembles uh, a gesture closing the mouth with a key, which suggests perhaps secrecy, uh, and which is commonly, well, which is not uncommon in the Netherlands, I would say. Um, the gesture woman was also interesting because actually it's a highly iconic gesture. Um, as you can see, the West African respondents um, opted for the meaning woman more often, even though the meaning of mother and breast was uh, quite similar across the two groups. Um, the Dutch respondents then more often went for, interpreted the use of the fists as uh, referring to the handling of something heavy like carry or heavy. Um, and I thought it was interesting that we, um, that even with a highly iconic gesture like woman, we see uh, differences between the groups. Um, similarly, with, with the gesture for work, which, re which uh, represents the, the wiping of sweat from the forehead, forehead uh, we, the Dutch respondents more often interpreted that as hot or referring to temperature, and the West African respondents uh, as referring to work or tired. Okay, so in brief, we, we seem to, to see region-specific patterning in 12 out of the 14 gestures, uh, including uh, the ones that we previously plotted on the map. So dead, hit, refused, what, work, and woman. Um, we had hoped to be able to zoom in uh, at a more microscopic level, perhaps, uh, to look at uh, isoglosses and... Um, to look at, at the results per country. 
of course, the, the number of respondents per country varied greatly. And also we found some very surprising results that we didn't really understand. For example, the gesture refuse was hardly recognized by the five Nigerian respondents, which uh, greatly surprised me based on uh, the offline uh, results and also on the literature of, uh, on gestures in uh, Nigeria. So uh, hard to interpret. Another surprising result was, uh, were the results, the per country results for dead. Um, so the closing of the nose, which is actually found in Malian sign language, suggesting, suggesting that it would be used there. But actually uh, the respondents, uh, several respondents did not recognize that meaning, uh, which was quite puzzling. Um, and, uh, well, this leads me to, um, well, this, with the, this might also point at another challenge for quotable gesture research, which is uh, diverse or variation, uh, diversity or variation in gesture knowledge uh, within a group. Um, alternatively, it may point at, uh, Another factor or feature observed, which is that sign languages kind of may serve as reserves for um, outdated gestures. All in all, the conclusion is clear that much more data are, uh, is needed. And so um, hopefully we'll be able to set up a larger new study uh, with in-person data collection, open questions, and the use of local languages while maintaining the use of videos. Um, so basically this interper interpersonal variation that I uh, just mentioned in the context of dead uh, may take many forms. So it can relate to age. So we see some gestures being specific for children, uh, gender, socioeconomic status, and a whole range of other uh, factors that may come at play. Um, while moving to the end, um, I hope you bear with me. I just wanted to mention a very uh, interesting methodology that was pioneered by uh, our chair of today, Mariana Martins, um, who did interviews with deaf signers, uh, realizing that deaf signers on a daily basis observe and engage with nonverbal communication of hearing non signers and also uh, discuss this uh, amongst themselves. So uh, having that in mind, Mariana uh, interviewed deaf uh, signers about the gesture use of hearing non-signers. And uh, this yielded very interesting results and observations. For example, that indeed uh, not, all the de not all the hearing people know or use the, the gesture for dead and uh, others may use a different one, which is basically uh, sliding the throat. Uh, they also commented on gender variation in gesture use. So all in all, this uh, seems to be a promising, interesting window on gesture use that um, uh, would be interesting to, to expand. So to conclude, uh, a lot of text here again, sorry. Um, Basically, lexical similarity across sign languages can result from inheritance from an older sign language variety, like in the Japanese sign language family, uh, from iconicity or from the independent integration of the same quotable gesture, like in the case of refuse and uh, probably the other uh, lexemes that we saw as well. Um, the case studies show that we need to carefully study the aerial, aerial distribution of quotable gestures to say anything solid about this influence. Um, gestures are hard to grasp, they are elusive, and we need uh, reliable but also efficient methods to uh, do large-scale distributional studies uh, of quotable gestures. And uh, which are indispensable for understanding the relation um, between sign languages and also for sign language typology as a consequence. And uh, as Martin's, Mariana Martin's study uh, suggests, the observation of deaf signers seems to be uh, an efficient method, uh, additional method for documenting the use of gestures and their variation. 
And uh, I want to thank the many deaf and hearing people who either participated in this, in this uh, the studies reported here or who helped me with this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And also to the audience for your attention. Thank you, Victoria. This is such an interesting uh, topic and you made it so clear. Thank you. Uh, for now, we have uh, two questions, uh, one from uh, an, an Anderson Almeida da Silva, and he asks, what is the difference between quotable gestures and emblems? Yes, uh, thank you. Sorry, I, I, um, I think I skipped that part. I use it as uh, identical terms. Sorry, I should have, have mentioned that. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, uh, also David Saavedra, he more than more as a comment says that uh, Colombian sign language also has a similar, uh, uh, well, sign that maybe comes from the gesture, this one, uh, also with a negative connotation, meaning worst. So, yeah. Wow. That's uh, wonderful. That's a wonderful comment. Thank you so much. Um, I will, I will, uh, I'm very happy uh, for such contributions. Thank you very much. Well, uh, for now, uh, no more questions, but if uh, you don't mind, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, why is it so difficult to find uh, 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 repertoires of gestures for different uh, countries and regions? Yeah. Uh, well, I think so. Well, I think there are several diff diff difficulties or challenges. I think one of the uh, challenges is also that perhaps, like sign languages, um, uh, several or a, for I, there seems to have been an idea of the universality of gestures. Um, just like we have that that prejudice about sign languages, it also seems to have existed for sign for gestures. So we, we um, I think that might be a potential explanation for um, not having so many studies. And then of course, um, I I have also come across and for a long time ignored, to be honest, um, books that look like rather popular books without a lot of scientific um, promise um, or that, that look like more, um, yeah, well, that, that do not explain how the data were collected, for example, or where the data exactly were collected, but that just put, a, to, put together a lot of quotable gestures. Um, I think they are actually more valuable than we may think. Um, but, in, but indeed, I think also the fact that, that printing pictures and printing drawings is just expensive and, and time consuming, I think that might be part of the challenge as well. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, those are some thoughts I have. Uh, talking, about, uh, talking about methods, uh, what, what would you think would be like this, uh, a good method to study gestures? Yeah, I think that's that is a very big challenge. I think that is something we need we need to find out. Uh, for sure, it looks more and more like we need a, a lot of resources, human resources, and also financial resources uh, to document this. Um, and I also think that that we um, probably need to come up with uh, a combination of multiple methodologies, trying to look at gestures from several perspectives to like the like uh, discovering an elephant in a dark room right is that the metaphor i don't know uh, if you feel here you'll feel the trunk somewhere else you you feel a leg so i think if we use different methodologies and, and put those together we will get a more rich a richer uh, understanding of, of uh, gestures quotable gestures and hopefully their spread. But definitely I think uh, that your methodology um, of uh, looking at uh, or asking deaf people about their observations, I think is a very promising um, methodology that uh, 
would be very nice to elaborate further. Yeah, uh, well, still no more questions. Um, so, I don't know. Oh, was clear. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything else? Yeah, well, I would like just to uh, to thank uh, you all for, for being here. I, I can't see you, unfortunately. Uh, only you, Mariana. Um, but uh, thank you. And also thank you for the, the questions uh, and the comment that was um, given. Very interesting. And if anybody has questions or comments later, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Uh, well, we have we have another question here. <laughs> Sorry, uh, from uh, Armanda Delgado, and she's asking. Uh, she's saying uh, she was wondering uh, if the option answer task didn't prompt participants to respond. How do you account for this possibility? Okay, can you repeat that? Uh, would the option answer task? So the online task, I suppose, uh, didn't prompt participants to respond. Yeah, if I if I understand your question, uh, if that didn't bias or push the, um, the respondents in a in a particular direction, um, I, I I don't know if, if that's what you're what you're asking. Uh, and if that's what you're asking, then I would say yes, that probably is the case. But then you would expect that effect to be equally present in the Dutch responses, as well as in the West African responses. So that's why you basically have that. That's why we use that bench line for comparison, basically. Okay, okay. and the final comment. Uh, very interesting, your research. Uh, there is no standard in gesture worlds. No standard in? Gesture world. Right, right. <laughs> thank you okay. too. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Abralim, and thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. And please continue watching the series. <laughs> Bye.